I just wanted to give you an introduction of um, uh, kind of the the approach that ASCO has taken for um, helping to you know provide guidance on how to manage uh, cancers you know very prevalent cancers um, across the globe and you know as as Dr. Park um, mentioned uh, you know cancer doesn't know where you're from it just knows that it's going to keep growing and so we we need to provide um, guidance uh, to um, disparate areas where where resources are different for uh, the management of of cancer, and I think um, you know they've done a really exceptional job at this. So this is just some background about ASCO, um, and you know it. Um, although um, sixty percent of the ASCO membership comes from the U.S., nearly forty percent come globally, international. Um, members, um, you know, from over 170 countries. And the most prevalent are, you know, India, Japan, Brazil, Australia, Mexico, China. It's really, really quite amazing. So we really do feel, um, you know, that ASCO is is really a global um, uh, clinical oncology society. Um, and, and in terms of ASCO's um, strategic plan, you know, the, the mission is to conquer cancer through research, education, promotion of the highest quality, um, equitable patient care. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted to highlight that, you know, th so there's a vision with regard to prevention and cure. And then the core is really focused on um, evidence, care, and impact. And, you know, as you go down this strategic plan, I you know want to highlight that global um, impact is really really central to our mission. We really feel that it's it's you know it, it's important to provide excellent care not only you know in um, the U.S. or North America or Europe or China but around the around the world where where not everyone has the same access to. Um, you know, cutting edge uh, technology and that sort of thing, um, and and so ASCO has created regional councils um, across the globe, and and these are um, you know uh, highlights of them. So Asia Pacific in purple, uh, we have Central Europe in blue, um, the Indian Advisory uh, Group um, in, over here, and then Sub-Saharan Africa as well as Latin America. And and this is um, really intended to um, help provide gu guidance to ensure that we're meeting uh, the needs of the global community. And so through, you know, with this kind of backdrop in mind, I thought that um, talking about colon cancer, there are several guidelines that were created a few years ago um, for colorectal cancer. And and I, I wanted to highlight the, the approach that ASCO uses for resource stratified areas. So there's screening and prevention, early stage disease, and metastatic disease. And you know, each of these could be a three hour or, or half a day symposium. So it, it this is really abbreviated. I'm just, you know, taking uh, snippets from screening and prevention and early stage disease so you have an idea of what we're what we're really talking about from a resource stratified standpoint. So um, ASCO resource stratified guidelines. The purpose is to provide expert guidance on, at least for early detection, colorectal cancers to clinicians, public health leaders, and pol policymakers in all resource settings. Um, and they established a process for resource stratified guidelines, which includes mixed methods, for guideline development, adaptation of the clinical practice guidelines of other organizations, and formal expert consensus. So the reality is that there won't be randomized trials that provide level one evidence in all different settings. In fact, the randomized trials almost exclusively are in enhanced or high, highly resourced areas. And so how do we extrapolate the data from advanced um, randomized trials uh, that that inform guidelines to under resource areas. So this this methodology um, allows us to do that. Um, and um, you know, in the developing resource stratified guidelines, they they you know created a framework of a four tier resource setting approach. So 
basic resources, limited, enhanced, and maximal. Um, uh, and this is developed by the Breast Health Global Initiative, and uh, mod modification of this framework is based on the disease control priorities. So it's, you know, it's based on evidence-based methods to try to um, create you know, some structure where there sometimes isn't structure. And the framework emphasizes that variations occur not only between, but within countries as well. So even even within um, enhanced or maximal settings, you can imagine that uh, patients have um, don't have equal access to care. And so um, you might be able to apply a resource stratified guideline to where, where a patient may have only limited or basic um, availability of, uh, you know, of, of resources uh, to manage their cancer the best way. Um, and so the Clinical Practice Guidelines Committee, the process includes a sy uh, systematic literature review by ASCO guidelines staff. Expert panel is created um, to critically review the data and interpret the data uh, and inform the guidelines. And then uh, they create the guidelines. And then the Clinical Practice Guidelines Committee actually uh, uh, provides a formal approval. And, you know, this process altogether takes, you know, up where from anywhere from eight to 10 months all the way to a year and a half. It, it's really, really quite comprehensive. And it is it is different than other, um, other uh, you know, platforms. Like, you know, the, the NCCN also provides um, guidelines, but that's more of a management algorithm. It tells you from you know, a certain stage and what the, you know, the, what the treatment things are here, we're really uh, taking literature and asking questions that we can address through this process. So, for example, here are the key clinical questions for early detection that were uh, developed a few years ago. So, um, in both high incidence and also resource constrained settings, what are the optimal strategies for population level early detection of colon cancer? What is the optimal reflex testing strategy? What's the optimal strategy for people with premalignant polyps um, or other abnormal screening results? And then what are the optimal methods for diagnosis of patients with signs and symptoms of early colorectal cancer? So the target population for the guideline were for people who were asymptomatic at the time in 2019 when this was written, the ages were 50 to 75. And of course, we know that um, the guide, the the recommendation for colorectal cancer screening now in the in the United States actually begins at the age of 45. Um, but these are patients without a family history, average risk, um, in settings of high incidence of colon cancer, um, and in uh, patients who may or may not have symptoms. And the target audience is actually almost everyone, patients, caregivers, gastroenterologists, surgeons, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, primary care providers, health planners, and policy makers. And, um, and this is kind of a high-level uh, table of, of the setting that you see in columns, basic resource setting, limited, enhanced, and maximal. And then, and then uh, across the... Um, the far left, you see the rows: screening, reflex testing, endoscopy, imaging, and surgery. So um, it kind of gives you an idea of uh, how how the different categories were kind of defined. So let's let's just think about colonoscopy. Um, so um, in enhanced and maximal settings, colonoscopy is readily available. Uh, but um, in limited settings or in very basic settings, it may not be as widely available. We could think that maybe a flex sig is available in limited settings. And in very basic settings, we're really thinking about digital rectal exam, then maybe even a barium enema. And uh, let's think about imaging. So imaging, we think of um, CAT scan, MRI, PET scans are probably widely available in maximal settings. In enhanced settings, PET scans may be less available. And then, you know, down to basic settings where really we're thinking about, uh, you know, simple x-rays are, are what's available. So, so across these different settings, we, um, and then we can think about radiation therapy, pathology, and palliative care. Um, you know, the, the, you can see that in basic settings, radiation may not be available. Um, in, uh, 
uh, pathology is the critical aspect of management. And, you know, even though it may not be available in basic settings, um, there is usually a way for the pathology to be sent to other areas for review. Um, and then, you know, palliative care, as you can see down here. So, you know, just for example, in uh, clinical question one, what are the optimal strategies for patient-level early detection of colorectal cancer in high-incidence and resource-constrained uh, settings? So the general recommendations would be that screening for colorectal cancer is recommended for asymptomatic people. It would be ages 45 to 75, not 50 anymore, um, with average risk of cancer um, where the incidence is high and the mortality is high. Um, and... Um, yeah, this this is sort of not involving patients with certain risk factors like a family history, inflammatory bowel disease, FAP, or Lynch syndrome. For these uh, uh, cohorts of patients, the screening guidelines are in fact different. So, um, you know, in the basic setting, um, the recommendation is that patients should people should get um, the high sensitive guaiac fecal occult blood test, um, which you know could be done every year um, or every two years, depending on available resources. And you know, we also grade each uh, recommendation with the qu the evidence quality and the strength of recommendation. So here we think that the evidence is high and the strength is strong. And again, again the idea here is that if you have a positive test then you may be able to act on it uh, to identify the cause of bleeding and uh, ideally identify early stage or pre-malignancy uh, where, where patients can you know, really have a significant impact. Um, and then, um, you know, recommendation 1.2 um, is, you know, if available, the the sort of newer generation fecal immunochemical testing FIT instead of just for blood is preferable every year, um, and this is you know a recommendation in in the setting where colonoscopy may not be available. And then in the limited setting, uh, the recommendation is a flex sig um, every five years, um, and in the uh, and and then you know. You, you might even consider recommendation 1.4, flex sig every 10 years, plus the FIT test, immunohistochemical test every year, or the fecal occult blood test every year if the FIT is not, is not available. And then in the enhanced setting, um, you, this is where we're getting to the FIT flex sig, um, as well as colonoscopy every 10 years, um, starting at age 45. So, so this gives you an idea of kind of how how we um, make the recommendations based on availability of resources and and trying to balance that with um, the best evidence for improving a patient's you know care. And then uh, you know just shifting to early stage colon cancer, these are the questions that we asked here. Um, what is the optimal treatment for patients with colon cancer stages 1 through 3C in high incidence and under-resourced constrained areas? What is the optimal treatment for patients with rectal cancer stages 1 through 3? And then post-treatment surveillance um, that uh, for early colorectal cancer. And, and here I'll just highlight, um, uh, so, so these are the, uh, you know, recommendations for for uh, question one, um, where, you know, in, in, Basic settings, the locally advanced tumors are are treated with surgery, and the you know in enhanced settings, we're talking about laparoscopic or robotic surgery uh, versus open open resection. Um, for stage three cancers and some stage two cancers, chemotherapy would be offered after surgery where chemotherapy is available. And then the surgical pathology evaluation is really critical from that standpoint as well. And the resource setting is important um, in terms of addressing that. But here I wanted to highlight um, question three, which is the post post-treatment surveillance in basic, limited, and enhanced and maximal settings. So, um, you know, in terms of like, you know, seeing a doctor, getting a blood test is, if possible, in the basic setting, the recommendation is every six months for three years. Um, and it's actually similar across uh, limited and enhanced and maximal settings. But I think um, in terms of surveillance colonoscopy, um, you know, it, it, it becomes 
it's still recommended in basic and limited settings um, every, you know, once in the first one or two years after surgery. Uh, but then, you know, for enhanced and maximal settings, the recommendation is um, in year one and every three to five years, depending on what the findings are. Um, and then in terms of rectal cancer, for example, we're uh, talking about a rectosimoidoscopy for uh, the colonoscopies, uh, um, uh, surveillance uh, versus a colonoscopy where it may be more available in enhanced and maximal settings. And then, you know, here we're talking about radiation as well um, and, and, uh, and, you know, what's available with regard to um, early stage rectal follow-up. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.